Good morning. We have uh, general questions. Question number one in the name of Claudia Beamish has not been lodged, but the member has provided an explanation. Question number two, Kenneth Gibson. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on the commitment of Royal Mail to maintaining the universal service obligation, given its economic impact. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. Presiding officer, postal services are a vital lifeline for many of Scotland's communities, particularly in some of the nation's more remote rural areas. Those communities depend on the delivery service guaranteed by the Royal Mail's universal service obligation, which is why it is so deeply worrying to see Royal Mail's concerns about its ability to fulfil the universal service obligation. The Minister for Energy, Enterprise and Tourism has written to the UK Government requesting reassurances that the universal service obligation still stands. With independence, the regulation of mail will be in the hands of the Scottish Parliament, providing an opportunity to ensure a universal postal service that is in the best interests of communities and postal service users is achieved. Uh, an independent Scotland would also ensure we have the ability to restore the Royal Mail in Scotland to public ownership. Kenneth Gibson. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that reply. He will no doubt be aware how important this issue is for Scotland's rural and island communities, including Arne and Cumbria and my own constituency, and indeed he touched on rurality in his first response. On uh, page 289 of the White Paper, the Scottish Government raised concerns about the future of the universal service obligation in relation to Royal Mail privatisation. And does the Cabinet Secretary agree that no, uh, keeping Scotland's rural and island communities well connected via post and other means is absolutely vital? And indeed, can he explain how we would be more able to address the challenge and effectively serve Scotland's rural and island communities with the full powers of an independent country? Cabinet Secretary. I think there are, there are three points that I would make to, to Mr Gibson in my response. The first is that uh, he is absolutely correct, and I highlighted this in my um, initial answer, that uh, postal services are, are fundamental to the connectivity of rural and island communities, um, and the government accepts that point, and that's why we attach such importance to the universal service obligation. Secondly, there is the issue of um, digital connectivity, which we recognise to be of equal significance in enabling businesses and individuals to be properly connected in the modern world. And thirdly, and this is where the opportunity of Scottish independence opens up the ability of the government to ensure that all of these aspirations are properly and effectively fulfilled by the way in which we take forward uh, the uh, universal service obligation um, as part of the uh, exercise of responsibilities of an independent government. Question three. Annabel Goldie. To uh, ask the Scottish Government what the principal challenges for the economy would be in an independent Scotland. Cabinet Secretary. Presiding Officer, Scotland has a strong and prosperous economy. GDP per head was the 14th highest in the OECD in 2012, ahead of the United Kingdom, Japan, Italy and France. In common with most other advanced economies, Scotland will face a number of challenges in the years to come, including tackling inequalities and building greater economic resilience. Independence would equip future Scottish governments with the policy levers required to provide greater flexibility in decision making, offer an opportunity to rebalance the economy and fully tackle the economic issues of population, productivity and participation. Annabel Goldie. Presiding officer, I must apologise to the Cabinet Secretary because I realise that even this entire question time slot is inadequate to describe the economic challenges confronting an independent Scotland. Yeah, yeah. Now that we know the financial illustration on page 75 of the White Paper is wrong, having ambitiously overestimated oil revenues and grossly understated expenditure, thereby producing a budget deficit dramatically lower than the Institute of Fiscal Studies' recent projection of £8.6 billion, pounds, will the Cabinet Secretary scrap page 75 and produce a corrected version? Cabinet Secretary. I don't, I don't know if Baroness Goldie was unavailable last week. Perhaps she was in the House of Lords and didn't catch up with the projections that I set out last week, which were full and comprehensive, uh, and set out the government's estimates based on the most uh, recently available information on the financial health of Scotland in 2016 17. And of course, there are differences of opinion on these questions. Uh, the IFS, as uh, Ms Goldie has just cited, uh, take forward the Office for Budget Responsibility figures on oil and gas revenues, for example, which ignore the fact that the oil price is, um, for a two-year period, has been $11 higher than the OBR estimate, and on a variety of projections, not least of which the deck projection is likely to go even higher, although we've not used that assumption. And secondly, ignores the fact that when oil and gas companies are investing £14 billion in oil and gas activity in the North Sea, 
Um, the OBR believe, and endorsed by the IFS, that somehow there will be no increase in production in later years as a consequence, despite the fact that the industry analysts contradict that information. So I would encourage Ms Goldie to go and look at the uh, financial projections that we set out last week, which addressed directly the question that she has raised. And the final point I would make, presiding officer, is this. Ms Goldie cites the analysis of the Institute for Fiscal Studies, which essentially are an indictment of the management of the public finances of this country by Westminster governments, and it is time that we acquired the powers to deliver a better economic future for the people of our country. Malcolm Chisholm. Uh, of course, the Cabinet Secretary is right to say that there are different opinions on these matters, but is it not the case that the vast majority of economists do uh, point out that the fiscal situation for an independent Scotland will be more difficult than for the rest of the UK? And also, as I reminded him last week, that interest rates will certainly be higher uh, for a considerable period of time. Cabinet Secretary. On, on the first point that Mr Chisholm raises, um, he talks about the, um, the, 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 the variety of voices. If he looks at the OBR, the IFS, the CPPR, all of the analysis that is undertaken uh, on uh, these questions is driven by the OBR analysis. No other separate analysis, no other detailed uh, research process. It's all driven by the OBR statistics. And I've set out in co some considerable detail last week the issues that we take with the OBR analysis of oil and gas revenues. And, of course, what the analysis last week showed is that Scotland's public finances in 2016 on all key fiscal measures would be similar to or stronger than both the UK and the G7 industrialised countries. And I think it's high time that people in, this, in the opposition parties in Parliament recognises, recognised that we have opportunities to create a better economic future in Scotland. The question is do we have the, the, the determination and the confidence to acquire those economic powers and start to tackle the issues of inequality and poverty that exist in our, in our society and which the Labour Party, the Liberals and the Conservatives are prepared to tolerate for a good deal longer. Yeah. We are not. Question four, Dave Thompson. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the progress of the models for GP practices in rural areas. Cabinet Secretary Alex Neil. Presiding officer, the Scottish Government continues to promote a range of initiatives to recruit and support GPs working in remote and rural areas, including work led by NHS Highland to develop and test innovative ways of delivering health care in rural areas of Scotland. Progress has been slower than planned due to ongoing difficulties in recruiting GPs to vacant posts. To address these difficulties, a bespoke recruitment exercise is under development, which it is anticipated will be in place by the summer. I can assure the Chamber that the Scottish Government recognises the current challenges in remote and rural healthcare delivery and is committed to ensuring that all communities in Scotland have access to high quality and sustainable healthcare services. Dave Thompson. Yeah, the Cabinet Secretary uh, will be aware, and he has mentioned the West Lochaber area. My constituents are very concerned about this because although the, the model being driven by NHS Highland and and supported by the Cabinet Secretary is a good model. The difficulty in attracting uh, GPs to uh, these posts is what we have to overcome. And of course, in the meantime, we are spending an awful lot of money on locum GPs, which is costing the Health Board a fortune. I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary can elaborate a wee bit more on the sort of bespoke model that he mentioned there just now. Cabinet Secretary. The presiding officer, I'm pleased that one new GP has been appointed and a major recruitment campaign will be launched in the next few weeks with the support of a marketing expert to recruit the additional GPs needed to staff the model. Uh, and of course the model was a, the original proposal for this model actually came from the local GPs. In the meantime, we've been fortunate in having some consistent locums that have been able to provide continuity of care, and Dr Gartshore is providing clinical leadership for the locums. But can I say that we are happy, along with Highland uh, Health Board, to look at any additional work that we can do, for example, more extensive use of telehealth to try to overcome the problems both in West Loch Haber and indeed in other remote rural areas right across Scotland. Richard Simpson. How can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his answers? Uh, he has, of course, just tabled the new pharmacy regulations, which may remove some of the uncertainty, though it's disappointing that there isn't a, a proposal to have joint pharmacy uh, GP 
uh, um, um, dispensing established. But I wonder if, if he would recognise, along with me, that actually a marketing programme, whilst welcome, actually is going to have a problem recruiting until the uncertainty around current applications for pharmacy for some areas is dealt with. And will he recognise the problems that have been created in Killin and Drimmon, uh, and also possibly in Aberfoyle if the appeal against the pharmacy is not successful, by existing pharmacy applications? Presenting officers, because I recognise these problems that I've actually taken action to deal with it. And that's why the regulations are now before Parliament and assuming that they are approved by Parliament will be implemented at the earliest possible opportunity. I think it's highly regrettable that, for example, in the Cumbria, uh, we have lost a GP dispensary uh, because a pharmacy came in and they cost so far to the health board in recruiting lo locums for that particular area has been half a million pounds. Now, that's money that would be far, far better spent in other parts of the health service in investment. So I absolutely agree with the analysis, and I've put in place action to deal with the problem. Ms Crawford. I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary would agree with me in relation to Drimmon in particular that it is disappointing that some political parties were putting out the message that it would be possible in law to bring a moratorium in before the new regulations came in, because that is what has been happening, and it has been misleading local people. And would he also welcome the fact that the Health Board turned up to a meeting uh, this week with over 200 people to explain how that would be taken forward, and I've I was actually the only MSP who was in attendance. Cabinet Secretary. A presiding officer, a Bruce Crawford makes a number of very relevant and absolutely true points with which I agree. I think one of the great tragedies of recent developments has been the spreading of disinformation. We saw it with the policy on the continuing health care, where deliberate disinformation has been spread by certain political elements who, quite frankly, should know better. Tavis Scott. Can I reinforce Sir Richard Simpson's point and agree with the Cabinet Secretary's uh, remarks in terms of how important pharmacies are to GP practices? I have the regulations uh, here. Would you be able to tell Parliament and, more importantly, GP practices what practical difference these new regulations will make so as to ensure that some of the circumstances that uh, other members have described, and certainly I have had in my own constituency, are not repeated in the future? Cabinet Secretary. The, the two core uh, impacts that these new regulations will have are, number one, there will be a community, a community voice in the application process, which to date has been missing, and that's going to be extremely important. And secondly, the board now has the power in looking at any particular application to look at the potential consequences of an application on the wider health service, in particular uh, the impact on primary care services in their area. Now, at the moment, the board would not be legally covered by the existing regulations if they took that consideration into account when deciding an application. They now will be able to do that so that in a Cumbria type situation, for example, if the consequence of approving a, an entry for a new pharmacy is that you're going to lose your local GP service, that would be justification for the board refusing uh, the application for the pharmacy. Question number five, Paul Martin. Uh, thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government when the Cabinet Secretary for Health and Wellbeing last met NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde and what matters were discussed. Cabinet Secretary. Alan Presiding Hill. Officer, Ministers and Government officials regularly meet with representatives of NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde to discuss matters of importance to local people. Paul Martin. Uh, President Officer, I wonder when the Minister, when he met with the Health Board, if he discussed the fact that the proportion of Scots aged between 16 and 64 who were overweight or obese increased to 60.1% in 2012. Uh, has he considered the new guidelines from the National Institute of Health and Care Excellence, particularly the recommendation that state-funded slimming classes should be considered as a cost-effective means of dealing with obesity problems? Presiding officer, I've made it absolutely clear both to the public health function within the National Health Service in Scotland as well as uh, NSS and the health boards that we should be looking at every single way we can improve exercise and diet, particularly in areas of deprivation and poverty. As we know, whether the condition is cancer, stroke, heart disease or a range of other problems, obesity and overweight is a major contributing factor through lack of exercise and lack of a proper diet. 
So we are actually engaged in a whole range of initiatives across the country, and we're proposing, proposing to engage in many more to encourage people to take much more exercise and to improve their diet as a prerequisite to improving their health. Jackson Cannell. Uh, having met the board, is the Cabinet Secretary satisfied that each of the obstacles to which he has recently referred, uh, acting as impediments to the introduction and access of all new medicines, have now been overcome? Cabinet Secretary. Yeah, we have a, we're in constant touch with the board and indeed with others like the Beats and Oncologists who have expressed concern about the particular process in Glasgow. Uh, and I have made it absolutely clear that I expect the Glasgow process to be as robust as every other process in every other part of the country and that there should be no denial of access to medicines in Glasgow, which is available to uh, patients elsewhere in Scotland. Question number six, John Lamont. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions it has had with the Commonwealth Games Organising Committee about the use of the Special Reserve Fund. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robertson. The Games continue to be delivered on time and on budget. The Scottish Government meets the Glasgow 2014 Organising Committee frequently to discuss a wide range of issues relevant to the delivery of a successful Games. Those meetings cover financial matters, including how to manage all the elements of the budget, including the Special Reserve. John Lomond. Um, well, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. Last week it was reported that the Commonwealth Games organisers were preparing to access the Special Reserve Fund to finance alterations to the opening and closing ceremonies. While we are all anticipating an exciting and successful Games, the Special Reserve Fund was only intended to be called upon, in the words of one government official, if, it, if a really unexpected left-field event occurred. Access to the fund has to come through the First Minister. So could the Cabinet Secretary confirm whether the reports are accurate? And if so, how much money will be taken from the Special Reserve? Cabinet Secretary. Um, can I say to the member that the operational contingency and the Special Reserve form part of the Games budget of £575.6 million. Pounds. The funds in the operational contingency and the special reserve are both available to be drawn upon to ensure that the Games can be delivered successfully and that the experience of uh, spectators is optimised. The organising committee has notified Games partners of potential pressures on the special reserve. At this time, £800,000 from the special reserve of £23.8 million has been notionally committed to meet these potential pressures associated with venue fit-out should they materialise. And access to the special reserve requires the approval of Scottish ministers. That has been approved, and any further uh, requests for use of the special reserve would similarly have to be approved by Scottish ministers. Question 7, Alex Ferguson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government when it will publish a report on the future of Shambilly House. Minister Hamza Yousaf. The Scottish Government has recently received the final report on the options for future use of Shambilly House. We intend to hold a public meeting in New Abbey in July, which will ask the Prince's Regeneration Trust to present that report and, of course, all those members to be involved in that meeting. We intend to publish the report itself on the Scottish Government website imminently. Alex Ferguson. Um, I'm, I'm very grateful to the Minister for that response, but the fact remains that the report was supposed to have been published in November, was postponed until March, and as far as I know, has been ready for publication since then. Nonetheless, that is good news. But what makes matters worse is that the grounds of Shambly House have been completely neglected by the Scottish Government since it took over responsibility for them, and the whole place now has an air of dereliction and decay. So can I plead with the Minister to at least ensure that some basic upkeep of the house and grounds is undertaken as a matter of urgency until the f further options for the property have been determined. Minister. The reason for the uh, ever slight delay in the report was, of course, because we had to go through those options uh, thoroughly, which I know the member uh, will understand. I absolutely give an undertaking uh, to the member that will put arrangements in uh, immediately to ensure that the grounds are uh, to the standard that we would expect them to be, and I will ensure that I report back to the member on those arrangements as soon as they are done. I can just squeeze in question number eight of the question and answers are brief. Gordon MacDonald. To ask the Scottish Government how many households there are in Scotland compared with the number of dwellings. Minister Margaret Burgess. The latest national records of Scotland's statistical publication on households and dwellings in Scotland estimates that as of June 2012 there were a total of 2.39 million households in Scotland where a household, where a household is defined as the people living together in a dwelling. This compares to a total of 2.5 2 million dwellings as of September of the same year. The number of households is fewer than the number of dwellings because some of the dwellings are vacant or second homes. Briefly, Mr. MacDonald. 
thank the Minister for that answer. The report highlights the 130,000 more homes in, than households across Scotland. Um, and the largest proportion of this difference is made up of vacant homes. Given that the housing problems in Edinburgh and there are 4,300 vacant homes in Edinburgh, uh, what steps is the government taking to encourage long-term empty properties back into use? Briefly, Minister. In 2012, we brought forward legislation to allow councils to increase council tax charges in certain long-term empty homes. We have also supported the work of the Empty Homes Partnership and provided for four and a half million empty Homes Loans Fund, and also it may be interest to know that a number of councils now employ a dedicated empty homes officers working directly with owners of empty homes to bring their properties back into use, particularly for affordable homes. Thank you, Minister. We now move to First Minister's questions. Question number one, Joanne Lamont. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. To ask the First